This conference will now be recorded. I got it. Thank you very much, Matthew. So again, we've got Rebecca White, Kristen Trustman, Lynn Geisinger, Dan Blankenship, and Rupp Bridges. Uh, I don't believe I've missed any members. If there are, please let me know. We've got some guests joining us today. So I'm Ron Pepsdorf, uh, Transportation Planning Director at Dr. Cog. Uh, Doug Rex, Matthew Halfant from Dr. Cog are also on the line. Uh, we've got Heather McKillop, Luke Palmasano, Jordan Sanchez, Natalie Shishido, Jennifer Brandeberry. Did I? Uh, Bar Barbara McManus from RTD. I see a mobile number, Shelly. I don't know who Shelly is. Uh, Shelly Cook from the RTD board. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you, Director Cook. Um, and then, um, Rebecca, did you want to make an introduction real quick before we get too far in the agenda? I'd love to. Um, so Ron had mentioned uh, one of our guests is Natalie Shishido, um, but hopefully we won't see her as a guest for long. This is a, a fellow that CDOT has hired to help support the accountability group. Um, she is a graduate student at CU um, in environmental management. Did I get that right, Natalie? Something close to that. Yeah, environmental uh, planning and management. Uh, so she is going to be with us about 20 hours a week uh, to the end of the calendar year and then uh, hopefully full time. Uh, after that, um, she's got a, a really great uh, background and I think is eager to jump in. So she's going to be joining a lot of the subcommittee meetings uh, and will be sort of going forward. Uh, she'll listen for things that she can help with, but please keep her in mind through our discussion um, and, and think of ways that she could uh, help us out, whether that be research, summarizing issues, memos, things like that. Um, I'd love to to tap her and, and give her a really great experience through this uh, fellowship as well. Thanks, Rebecca. <clears throat> um, so I think that concludes introductions. Rut, we, I did include in the agenda packet um, the meeting summary from the September 25th uh, meeting. So if uh, members have any uh, modifications or adjustments to suggest that, um, you can bring those up now or you feel free to um, email me and Matthew and we'll get any corrections made, but that's not an action item for the subcommittee. Okay, I've got a couple corrections, but I'll just wait and email them uh, to you and Matthew. Thank you, Rep. Sure. All right, so the next um, agenda item was um, uh, Mr. Bridges' presentation to the subcommittee, uh, Colorado's COVID crisis, RTD's risks and opportunities. Uh, Rudd, I think you can take it away whenever you're ready. Great. Um, this, I want to start by saying that this is a straw man for a proposal. Uh, and so one of the things I'm really looking for is input from the committee on things that you see that are problems or other ideas that you have or cri criticisms and critiques and all that are very much welcome. Uh, so let me let me go ahead and dive into it. One of the key uh, accountability committee assignments from Governor Polis and the legislature was to determine how RTD can achieve long-term financial stability and growth while still meeting its core mission. And we can talk about this now, but the, I think the reality is that until uh, until Colorado overcomes its COVID issue. Our, there really can't be a recovery for RTD. Uh, those things are just too big of a constraint in a number of ways that I'll discuss. So the, the presentation really promotes RTD as having vital assets that are critical to achieving uh, some of the real economic health, public health and, and uh, economic goals for the state. And so uh, as, as we get into that, a lot of what I'll do is I'll say, this is why we have these big challenges in RTD, and here's how we might get past some of that. So I'll dive on in. Uh, if you have any ideas or thoughts, please write them down as we're going through this. And uh, if we don't have time to go through all of them, then email them to me, rut at bridgesfamily.net. 
And uh, meanwhile, uh, we'll we'll try to get through as much as we can at the end, but uh, hold questions until then. So what are the big risks and, and opportunities? Well, if you look at the history of RT, it, it really exists to move people. And right now we're moving less than half as many people as, as we did last year and as we have historically. Uh, service has been cut 40%. We've got a $6 billion rail network that's carrying about a fourth of as many riders as, as it normally would. And sales tax and fare box revenues have really collapsed. And combined with low ridership, it forces, of course, much higher subsidies for riders. So here's, here's a graph you've probably seen before, but it really gives an example of how much that tax revenue has collapsed. And the board and the RTD advisors, you know, within RTD have really produced some pretty aggressive budget cuts in order to be able to get to the point that we're at right now, including big cut in transit, uh, rider, transit services. But we still got about $215 million shortfall and not a real clear idea of how we're going to get rid of all that. It's a pretty serious challenge that we're facing. This is, um, this is about COVID-19 and how it discriminates. And it truly does. If you look at the graph, uh, you, you're looking at, at three big categories here, African-Americans, Latino and Hispanic and Native Americans, and they're at like four times the risk of white non-Hispanics uh, to be hospitalized. And in terms of deaths, they're also way up there, but it's also true for seniors. 90% uh, of the deaths are people over 50 years old. And uh, and there's also the category of people with disabilities, a lot of whom have pre-existing health issues and all that. And, and there really needs to be parts of this. It's not a one fits all solution. There need to be solutions that are tailored to different groups in, in the community. But our customers are disproportionately impacted by this COVID virus. So this shows just quickly the how many how much it discriminates by age in terms of who dies these are the percent of the cases of COVID-19 that die and it's like one percent of those are under 30. so if you're under 30 you're probably not going to die from COVID and you've seen that discussed but this graphic really illustrates it quite a bit and 95 percent of the people that die are 50 or older so Understandably, RTD is mostly focused right now on how to survive 2021, and there are some serious challenges there. But I think there's a great value in RTD considering engaging with the state and, and a group of other organizations on how to get rid of the threat that's causing so much of our problems, which is this, this Colorado COVID crisis. So, We'll look at RTD's critical resources and we'll try to figure out how RTD can really play a vital role in this if they choose to do it and how we can fund it as well. So what's going on from a statewide perspective is that sales and income taxes are cratering uh, and the, you know, the legislature had to cut something like $3 billion out of their budget at the end of the end of last year. People are dying. Uh, a lot of people have lost jobs. We can't educate our kids the way we really need to. And so RTD is a victim of this, but it could be a real key part of the solution as well. So let's take a look at how it's really impacting RTD. Ridership, no big surprise here, has really fallen off a cliff. Why? There's a lot of people now that are working from home, but there are also people that aren't working at all. There's a lot of businesses that have closed. I was at a fundraiser last night and uh, I was talking to, to a friend, woman from that I'd known years ago, and she's a regular RTD user. And she said she's scared to use it now because of COVID. And so we've got a number of customers out there and it would be useful to poll and find out how many uh, who's, who aren't using it just because of their fear of COVID. 
The other thing that's kind of odd is congestion is not nearly as bad as it used to be. And so there's a bunch of people now driving that were using RTD before. So can we get back those customers? We've got to figure out a way to be able to do that. It's just essential that we get them back. So COVID, COVID safety is really expensive. When you look at what we spend on ensuring that, that people are safe, and a lot of people out there have no idea how the links that RTD goes to. Electrostatic decontamination sprayers, uh, we've cleaned the buses really thoroughly. Uh, they're plexiglass sheets put up for drivers, and uh, they're masks that are basically required for everyone. And all that is, is expensive, but the really killer thing here is social distancing. And before I go into that, I want to throw an idea out here because of this mask issue. We basically aren't letting people on the buses without masks. But if you lost this mask, one down here below, I bought a box of 50 of these for Amazon for 25 cents a mile. So instead of turning our, our drivers into bouncers, we need to let them be here. Why not just give away a free pass for people that don't have pass that want to ride an RTD? In the end, it will generate net income for RTD because what we get for them riding the bus is more than 25 cents. I certainly hope. So let's talk about social distancing. Uh, on buses, our medium buses are limited now to 15 riders, and our large buses are limited to 20 riders. Our light rail cars are limited to 30, as are the computer commuter rail cars. But those rail cars, for example, if you look at the standing room and everything else, when those things are, are going, you know, at, at max capacity, which is what a transit agency has to design for maximum capacity during rush hour. Uh, those things would hold anywhere from 160 to 170 people, and now they're down to 30. So we've got maybe a fifth of the capacity for moving people that we used to have. If you if you look at this, how are we going to recover? You know, if all of a sudden everybody tomorrow said, "I'm going to go ride RTD back the way it was." Last year, we couldn't carry those people because of because of the effect of social distancing. So it's critical that we, we resolve that. You look at all the combination of these things. You know, what are we going to do? Are we going to go to the voters and say we need a tax increase? Well, we got a recession that we're in the middle of. We got low ridership, and we've got the COVID crisis. It's hard enough to ever get a vote of, for a tax increase out of out of uh, Colorado voters. So RTD's recovery has got to begin when we conquer COVID. So we can talk about how that might happen, but it's not really possible that it will begin happening until we solve that bigger problem. Now, how do we quickly end Colorado's COVID crisis? Well, we have no control over mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. vaccines. Where's wrong? Was somebody saying I'm something? Fine. I can't hear you. Yeah, Rod, this is this is Doug Rex. Can I ask everybody? I think uh, folks that are on the phone specifically, if you could mute your phones, um, we're getting some feedback. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Doug. So, so we don't control when we're going to get vaccines, but the one thing we can do is make sure that when we get those vaccines, we're really ready to start delivering them and to start back immunizing people. There's this thing called herd immunity. If you get 70% of a herd immunized, then uh, a, a, a virus will not easily spread within that, within that herd. And it's true for all of us other mammals too. So the concept is creating a bunch of mobile teams. I call them back screws and maybe five lines of people being vaccinated each for each one of those. If you did that and you could vaccinate one person every five minutes, you could deliver 144,000 vaccinations every day, which theoretically within a month, we could have everybody vaccinated that we need to get vaccinated just to get to this herd immunity level. And that's one of the concepts of how we do it. Now, there are some vaccines that require two doses, 
but you get a fair amount of immunity just from the first dose. So in terms of getting people back to work and getting people uh, back engaged in society, getting our kids educated, that kind of rapid response would have a huge impact. And especially for RTD, because they really, you know, it's just hard to see a turnaround until we get past this. So RTD has some vital strategic assets, and I want to talk about those some. Here's a map of the RTD uh, parking rides, and that's, that is a vital asset potentially for places that we might set up immunization stations or for places people can park if we can set up immunization stations in, in, uh, in buildings or, or whatever that are near anywhere near this whole big uh, network that RTD has. So they're also underutilized transit services. So we could give people rides to, to get to all of these things on our, on our uh, light rail and our buses. Um, and we, and this is one of the, the big things. So I, I'm assuming here, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, all of the buses that RTD owns are not being operated right now with this 40% uh, cutback. Is that true? Anybody? So assuming we have some spare buses, <laughs> uh, that could play a role, not just in the RTD area, but in the whole state. So we've got some people that are very competent, that are motivated, and that unfortunately are soon to be laid off employees. And those are people that RTD is gonna need when we turn this around. And I think I've heard from other RTD folks that having to get rid of all of these people to get down to where we need to get our budget, we're gonna wind up having to hire people back. And here are experienced people that we could, we could use. Those people could engage in this process for immunization in different ways. It isn't just people giving shots. It's people organizing and setting up and lots of other things. The other thing we have is population proximity. And what I mean by that is if you look at our district, half of the people in Colorado live within the boundaries of, of RTD district. And so, we have all this infrastructure and that infrastructure is also where we need it to be to vaccinate half of the people in, in our state. So potential roles, and again, these are just ideas. I hope other people will have other ideas as well, but you know, the maintenance staff, for example, could put together and test these VAX crews because there's a lot of equipment associated with that. And, uh, and basically test them out at parking rides or uh, interior buildings or wherever. But the idea is you put together these, all the equipment for these VAX groups and outfit the buses that can deliver the vaccines, the staff, and all the essentials that you need to operate. Not just within RTD, but statewide. RTD planning staff, um, Managing and monitoring the logistics of these cruises is going to be a pretty significant challenge. And the governor has a group of people that are working on some of these things as well. So we sort of have to figure out how we can fit all this together. And then RTD's transit and parking lots in the, in the region, that's a lot of opportunity there. But uh, it's also the buses and drivers. I mean, we need to keep, especially some of these drivers, Turning around and laying off drivers after after all the challenges that we've had there would be an awful thing. But there are there are support roles for them throughout the rest of the state too, uh, for all of these. Now, hopefully, it'll be in cooperation with all the all the rest of the state and all the local groups and things like that. But some of that can come uh, directly from assets within RTD. So priorities for vaccination. Uh, the, there are a lot of different organizations, uh, not just in the in the country, but in the world that are saying who should be vaccinated first. And there'll be a lot of demand for those first vaccinations, believe me. But there are some that are really obvious, like your healthcare personnel, you want to make sure those people get vaccinated first. 
because they're on the front lines of, of trying to treat people. But there's lots of other groups too. Uh, but if you look at it, there, there are different things driving this. One is saving lives, but there's also the economic recovery, all the essential workers. And then ensuring handling and delivery of the vaccines is a challenge. And how do we as rapidly as possible roll out these immunities? I think RTD should make a real case that their customer facing RTD staff should have priority for vaccinations. But not just that, if you look at who our customers are, they're some of the most at risk essential workers out there. And they're in contact with a lot of the public. And so we should, we should argue for priority for all those folks. So what can go wrong? <laughs> There's always lots of things that can go wrong. One is you need a vaccine that's got uh, a high efficacy. And that basically means if you vac vaccinate 100 people, 99 of them, hopefully that vaccine will take and, and, uh, and they'll be healthy. Surprisingly, the vaccines are not all, all that necessarily high on their efficacy. You probably know about the, the MMR vaccines, measles, mumps, and rubella that, that kids always get. Well, the, me, the mumps part of that is really only has an effectiveness against mumps of about 78%. And so vaccines need to, need to be, we need something that's better than that. They also need to last for years. It shouldn't be something where you have to revaccinate every year like we do with the flu. And there's indications that a lot of these vaccines are, are going to be good for many years. They need to be, people need to be comfortable that they're safe and, uh, and we need a lot of doses. If we want to get to 70%, we need about 4 million doses. And hopefully by the second quarter of 2021. And we want a vaccine that is not going to have as much political resistance. And, uh, if, if we could do that, I mean, McKinsey says it's probably more like late 2021 before people would, states would have this herd immunity, but I think we could get there a lot faster than that. So we need funding and we need preparation uh, and we need execution too. Uh, Colorado just got about $3 million from a CDC grant. This was just for the planning process. We should, we should talk to the governor and to legislators and, and get their support and suggestions. We should also talk to our U.S. representatives and senators and, and make a strong lobbying case for federal support, not just for RTD, but for this vaccination process as well. And then contacting local foundations and, and the business community. We need to find out what the sources of funding could be and how we get access to that. What is the real value if we could eliminate COVID two months earlier than it otherwise would be eliminated? So RTD really can be a key part of the solution. Uh, and, and this is a real threat to the future of RTD. If, if this drags on for two years, uh, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a very challenging thing to try to turn around. Fewer layoffs and the ability to retain some of those key personnel uh, faster and, and more certain economic recovery for our customers because we need them to come back to RTD for their for their transit. And then part of this is the, depending on how we implement it, there's some little tricks we can do to start building ridership as start as, as soon as we start vaccinating. And then basically improving RTD's image image as a valued Colorado asset, which visibility of RTD engaged in solving this problem would go a long way towards doing that. We'd love for our new CEO, as well as the board and the people that work for, for RTD to, to be appreciated by the public and the voters. So the call to action is under the leadership, probably CDPHE is gonna, gonna lead all of this. In partnership with the legislature, with Dr. Cog, with local communities, UC Health and other regional health centers, uh, by mobilizing some of these RTD assets, we can be ready to rapidly immunize Colorado as soon as those vaccines are available. And note that no one other than maybe the president really expects to see a vaccine by year end. But there are a number of companies that 
at very year end or early in the next year, uh, believe they could deliver and begin to deliver in large quantities. So I think it's important to ensure that RTD plays a vital role in making Colorado safe and putting people back to work. And I think that we have to get there before we can get RTD back on a track to full recovery. Time is of the essence. So, you know, the thing I, I think I'd like to do is get feedback from the finance subcommittee uh, and basically try to find ways to improve some of the things that are in the straw man proposal and get suggestions from RTD staff as well and, and, uh, and Dr. Cog and, and wherever we can, we can get good ideas and how we could find a way for RTD to fit into this. Not for free, with support, with financial support, but to capitalize on these assets that we have and how we can make a difference. So I'm asking for the committee members to offer some thoughts and ideas and, and then we'll open it up to anybody else. Uh, I threw a few things out, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read through this. I'll anybody that is interested in this, uh, not just the committee members, but other people, I'm happy to send you a copy of the PowerPoint and hopefully get your feedback as well. So thanks. Ideas, folks, what do you think? Is this a reasonable thing to try to do? Hey, Rut, it's Kristen. I think- Hi, Kristen. Good morning. I good think- Good morning. I know I, I, in this, I didn't go into great detail about the challenges for people with disabilities, but it's gotta be part of that plan. They're some of the most at-risk people out there. We but are. That's why yeah. I'm stuck in my apartment. Uh, you really hit the nail on the head as far as getting RTD involved, because you're right. There are a lot of RTD employees or soon to be not employees that could be utilized. Same with the park and ride parking lots, plenty of room for people to show up. Uh, I, There's just going to have to be a lot of logistics. There sure is. It needs to be yeah, worked on. I, I appreciate that. And and I also would say that, you know, it's I don't think a problem like this is going to get solved by just sort of business as usual. I think one of the things that the RTD Accountability Committee really needs to do is think out of the box some about how we get at some of these issues. And I know this isn't a normal part of the business of RTD, and it's not a trivial pivot. Well, it's not the normal business of RTD, and that's what we're going to have to encourage, you're right, to think outside the box. RTD is not going to get back on their feet. They're not going to get back to normal unless all of these things happen, so why not be a part of it? And that is what we're going to need to promote. And okay. I noticed I noticed that Lynn is uh, looking to talk. So good. She, yeah, and Lynn's going to have to leave in, in a little while. So yeah, then let, let's let Lynn. And I've talked to you a lot. Lynn. Lynn? Great. Now I'm I'm good for the whole meeting today. I think I'm fine. But um, you know, this is really some some uh, very interesting and creative i think it's the big thinking you're so great at right um and uh i think that uh of course there's lots of logistics and lots of planning and i think you know you hit the nail on the head that it'll take uh funds and preparation and execution it's not what rtd does but i think it's um uh definitely worth you know moving forward to the next step i was just texting with Heather McKillop and she thought it was interesting as well. Um, and, you know, from from RTD's point of view, the uh, I'm just a couple of the big things that we need to be taken care of initially, obviously funds, as you mentioned, we, we aren't authorized to operate outside of RTD's area, but again, that can be fixed working with the union, um, all of those things. But, uh, um, you know, I think it's uh, uh, that you have some interesting ideas here. Um, 
it will take you know absent something like this and and even with who knows it, it will take a while i think for um rtd to build back up its ridership and i think that our our staff is expecting that to happen over the next you know five years or so so it may be even longer than two years um i just it's sort of some of your background because this will come up again in the in the future with this committee and the other committees um, I haven't seen the num the leads projections yet, and I'm not sure if um, Heather McKillop has them yet, but we will be having them very soon, if not. But I think sales and use tax is coming in a lot better. I don't think we're looking at $215 million next year, which um, I'm not saying this to reflect anything about your suggestion, just, just kind of putting putting that out there. And um, Well, I'm happy to hear that. I hope... I hope they come back like gangbusters, but we'll see how the, you know, yeah. if it's a big recovery or if it's a long view. At the same time, we had um, uh, a presentation last night from uh, an economist in this area and from a, a real estate firm, and so saying that the occupancy um, in commercial real estate, average Metro Denver now, um, is about 17%, so that tells you why our ridership is down so much um that's sort of just looking back at some of the uh, some of your initial proposal rtd has been giving out masks um and i think continues to give out um masks but you know that is a, a big piece of it and as you said the social distancing issues are big but um you know this is uh i think the kind of thing that that we need to be doing. Your proposal is the kind of thing we need to be doing, and and ours, you know, starting to do. We had a proposal last night where we're starting to look at how we bring ridership back. It was, um, you know, not addressing some of these issues as well. So, uh, kudos from me. I think uh, I think this is good thinking, and let's, um, you know, take it back to the team and and uh, the ones who could could answer more specifics. But I I think it's it's clever thinking. So thanks. Thank you. Hey, hey, Rhett, can you hear me? I can definitely hear you, yes. All right, hey, do you mind if I jump in on this just a little bit? So, uh, this, is, speaking, this, is Julie, this is Julie Duran Mollica. Oh, I just hi. wanted to, to call in real quick. Um, there you go, you can see me a little bit better. On this call, but yeah, well, I just, I just wanted to, of course, I just wanted to jump in on this because this is actually an area, hold on, I'm on the end line going north. Um, this is an area that I'm actually really um, familiar with. I'm an infection preventionist uh, at SDL Health, and I also am on the board of Tri-County Public Health, and I think that this is a great idea. So I wanted to first of all say that, and I support that, and we definitely should be reaching out to all lo our local public health departments to figure out how we can assist in this. I think it's important to plan, but it's also important to realize that we essentially don't have enough information about what these vaccines are going to be like, the efficacy of these vaccines. So there's still so many unknowns when it comes to this. I mean, even for my healthcare system, we were talking about this. And I mean, we have plans in place for when the vaccine comes, but we have essentially no data on what this vaccine is capable of. So um, I think it's really important conversation to have and to figure out how we could be a partner in this. Um, mm -hmm. But still, we have so much information we need to figure out. And um, and so working with local public health departments could really help. That way we're just in partnership with them, I think could be a, a really good um, place to move forward. And I think it's absolutely essential that we be in partnership with them. I mean, we'd be crazy not to, not to tap all the resources we can from all, all the different places and knowledge. You know, I mean, I don't know that much about vaccines, but I've sure learned a heck of a lot in the last three months. And and there are big differences. I mean, one of the, can you see these Canada vaccine slide that I just put up here? Yeah, one I of do. these, most of these are two dose vaccines. And if they're two dose vaccines, then it doubles what we have to do in order to get everyone immunized. And some of them, like that, you know, Pfizer has, made, has really talked a lot about, yeah, we're going to have this thing out really soon and all that. Their vaccines have to be stored at minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's not your average freezer there. It, it's really a, a pretty...
pretty unique piece of equipment. Uh, the one that I'm most excited about is this Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And, you know, I've been trying to learn all the differences between the mRNA vaccines and the adreno vector uh, protein-driven vaccines and all that. But th this one really looks pretty exciting. The early stages, the efficacies that they're seeing are in the high 90s on that vaccine. And it's a one-dose vaccine, probably. Not resolved yet. I mean, they're still, they just went out to their, they're doing a, a, their second, <clears throat> uh, third level trials with 60,000 volunteers. I'm glad to see the numbers of that. Most of these are doing 30. So, but yeah, there's, which vaccine we wind up with is going to be critical. And um, the whole AstraZeneca, Oxford University one is all still on hold. Good vaccine. So it's really the top three on this list that are really even possible, I think, at this point. But there's 23 different vaccines being tested right now. So who knows? So but this I, is Heather McKillop. Oh, hi. Make a comment. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, as along the lines that Lynn said, is I'm just appreciative of, I don't know if this will work or not, but I'm very appreciative of the fact that you brought a unique solution forward that um, uh, really um, uh, is an interesting concept of us being in charge of our own destiny, right? Instead of waiting for uh, things to happen around us that will help restore ridership that at least you're thinking along the lines of something unique and new and maybe how we can be part of the solution. And so I, I just have to say thank you um, because usually we hear all the things that we're doing wrong and what we can't do um, <laughs> versus um, maybe thinking of things completely differently. So like I said, I'm not an expert in this area as far as whether this will work or not. It will take a lot of coordination and a lot of unique things, but hey, in this time of pandemic, we're doing all kinds of things we've never done before. Um, so I, I just wanted to make that comment, um, uh, not necessarily speaking on behalf of RTD, but speaking on behalf of myself. Um, you know, I, I do appreciate you thinking totally, literally outside the box and, and how we can, I think it changes the conversation, right, about how we can be a part of the solution instead of uh, it just happening to us. So I appreciate that. Thank you for the time. You bet, Heather. And thanks for all that you do to try to keep this boat floating. <laughs> I know it's I know it's been tough times the last couple of years. Not just not just with this. Now it's really tough. But you know, part of what we have to do is think out of the box. Hey, Dan, uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about this because you you know you you run a transit agency and and you know, I don't know how practical being able to pivot in a way like this will really will really be. It doesn't take very many naysayers to kill something like this. Because it's not that Roaring Fork might do some parts of these things. Well, it's it's uh, it's really big thinking. It was not something I was expecting to. Uh, to consider as part of the finance subcommittee of the uh, RTD accountability committee. Um, and uh, it's, it's very out of the box. Uh, I think it would be challenging for uh, RAFTA to do something like this because we are using all of our vehicles and all of our people to transport you know, about one third of the passengers that we normally would be transporting because we're having to back up every bus and we're limiting the maximum capacity on a bus to 15 passengers. But that's not to say that we don't have park and ride facilities and other locations where people could come to get their vaccines. And, uh, and anything that we can do to be a part of the solution, I think we would be more than willing to do. I guess my thought would be, and it's, it's you know, it was good to hear Heather uh, indicate that, uh, you know, she thinks this is a good idea to uh, at least consider and, and help be part of the solution and, and, and take control of your destiny. But um, at some point, uh, somebody ought to reach out to the caller Department of Health and uh, Public Health and Environment and, and uh, share 
the concept with them and uh, see what they think. Uh, this may be an answer to a uh, missing, a huge missing piece of their plan about, well, how do we actually uh, distribute all of these vaccinations in a way that can be done uh, in our lifetime and very rapidly. Um, so I would, I would think it would be helpful to kind of plug them into um, either this group or at least give them a copy of this plan, uh, this plan and set up a meeting and you know, start the discussion with them. And then RTD needs to talk about it internally and see what their capabilities are as well. Right. I know Elise, you know, Elise is, was on rack for, uh, the, for a long time, the air quality side of that. And I know she knows people over there. I know some folks over at CPHE and so hopefully we can we can get over to them before our next meeting and have a conversation at least as long as nobody at RTD really says forget about it. You know, I, I think RTD's got the veto in in all of this, but I, you know, I, I would think it's and and also Jared uh, Governor Polis has got a, a a group together that's focused on all things COVID, and so some of those people that. There's just a, a lot of people around the through the process. The thing I worry about something like this is you've got to be pulled into the process. You've got to have people that want you. You can't push it away into this. But it seems like that there are some real vital, uh, real vital special things that RTD can bring to the party here that it's exciting to think about. <laughs> Yeah, I, if, if I go to one other slide, there's a couple other things I want to mention. Um, I think that one of the things that RTD ought to say is anybody that gets a vaccination gets 30 days free rides on RTD. It's not going to cost us anymore, really, to do that. And it's going to be one of the ways that we got vaccinated people coming on that we really can start the beginnings of rebuilding our, our ridership. And there are details of that. But the, the other thing is, if we get start getting enough people vaccinated and we have a way to easily tell that they've been vaccinated, then we could start having vax only rail cars in that group, which we could totally fill up instead of having to socially distance those. And we could have sections within buses or independent buses that were not socially distanced for vaccinated people. And there's one other thing too, I want to I want to mention that there are a lot of undocumented folks out there, and it's just as important that we get them vaccinated as well. And they're the ones that tend to be most suspicious of government, and it, it may be a real challenge to do that. So I've been thinking a lot about how you create a database, and this is you you guys have probably seen these before. They're QR codes. It's what you pick your phone up and click on if you want to you know, go directly to some place on the internet. But if if we had one of these associated, if everybody, and you, and you can create way beyond trillions of these things, you know, the, the, the number of the of unique QR codes is enormous. So creating a QR code that basically when you hold your camera up to it, pops up basically that this person has been vaccinated and here's their name and and uh, a photo of them. If, if you want to talk about getting people back to work, there are a lot of businesses that would love to hire people that have been vaccinated. And if they had some very easy way to say, here, I've been vaccinated, and they hold up a card that has their QR code, they, uh, an iPhone or whatever smartphone comes out, uses an app, clicks on it, takes the picture, and up pops the picture of the person and their name and the date they were vaccinated. And that's all. So very limited information that you would have to provide. Some kind of contact information that nobody else sees. It's just for the state so that if they find any problems with the vaccine, they can get back in touch with those people. But I think a very lightweight database is, is a critical part of this. But I, I really like this idea of employers being able to say, here's verification that my folks have been, have been vaccinated. And we could give them that without being too intrusive. Maybe number of people are really suspicious of government databases. And, and if you look at a lot of minorities, I mean, they remember all the way back to the Tuskegee trials, the syphilis trials, where they 
took a bunch of black people and, and used them essentially as guinea pigs to test how fast syphilis passed through communities and things like that. It just is a horrible history that, that we have here. And, and I'm not sure that in generally in, in the Latinx community, they're real comfortable with government, with our current situation, or uh, certainly Native Americans have got a lot to complain about in dealings with the United States of America. So these are communities we've really got to think through how we bring them into the vaccination process in a fairly lightweight way. Anyway, I, I don't mean to try to solve every problem or challenge that's in here, but I really would encourage anyone that, that can uh, to send me an email. Here's my email address and say, here's some other thoughts that I've got on this. You may want to you may want to think about. I'm looking for problems. I really am. You know, what what are the fatal flaws in this idea? So, so that's it for me. And I think we can move on to our rest of our agenda now. Thanks, Rod. I did see that Barb McManus had her hand up. Barb, Barbara, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, I just was going to say that um, Mike Meter in Safety and Security is uh, the person that's in touch with uh, the local health officials. Uh, he also did let us know at some point that uh, RTD employees, uh, particularly uh, on the represented side, are considered first responders and would be first on the list for vaccinations uh, the way the structure is set up already. Terrific. Can you send, would you drop me an email with the, his contact information? <laughs> and, be and happy to. Said also, that's good news. It's nice okay. when you've know, you got one less fight over who gets vaccinated to have to go through. Uh, actually, I'll just have him, I'll speak with him, have him respond to it directly to you um, because I, I certainly don't have all the ins and outs of what that looks like, but I'll ask him to define that. Great. Thanks. Well, one, of the, one of the things that occurs to me, I think, is um, kind of the vaccination rate and how quickly people will kind of rush to get vaccinated with a new vaccine that maybe you know, people mm -hmm. feel has been rushed through the testing and trial and uh, certification process. Um, can, should, can, should an agency like RTD, uh, can you mandate that your frontline employees get vaccinated? I'm not sure you can, but uh, not my area of expertise. What do you right. do if you've got operators that um, don't get vaccinated or won't get vaccinated uh, for whatever reason um, they have? I think that's that's probably you know the obstacles that you talked about right during your during your discussion is you know the the skepticism how how willing the public will be to actually get vaccinated um, yeah. and how quickly that will actually happen. It's a challenge, it really is, uh, yeah. and and one of the problems is that, that not only has it been politicized, it's been highly publicly politicized. Uh, obviously. Some folks want to have a by the you know by election day they want to have a vaccine that's all approved and everything else. Right. To their credit though, the the FDA has come back and said, you know, they they basically got a directive from the executive branch that skip all this stuff, you know, give us an early authorization. And they came back and said, We're not going to do any such thing. We have got a process here, it has worked, this is a critical issue. And we're not going to to give any early. Uh, it's one of the reasons I say I don't think there's a lot of chance we're going to see a vaccine delivered before probably the beginning of the first quarter. And even then, you know, you've got to build up your the number of the doses you can manufacture in short order. Yeah. But nonetheless, all that aside, there's plenty of people out there that don't trust. And and I did talk about that a, a little in that uh, last slide that was totally unreadable, full of stuff, that you really need to get people that are, uh, that are credible there as 
as uh, representatives to try to get people to jump into this. Yeah. Jump in is probably the wrong term too, but um, uh, th there's the issue of multilingual. Um, a bigger issue is the public trust and willingness by minorities and others to accept the new vaccine. Endorsement ads by minority nurses and doctors, other trusted spokespersons, question mark, Republicans and Democrats, dogs and cats living together, together in an ad, talking about different aspects of this, because there's a, it's amazing if, if Biden approves the vaccine, a bunch of Republicans don't like it, and if Trump approves it, a bunch of Democrats don't like it. So. Uh, this effort may need some funding, though there are earned media opportunities as well. So you're absolutely right. That is going to be a real challenge. And I, I don't say that. And I don't say that to suggest that, that we shouldn't we shouldn't pursue this talk, kind of pursue this idea, and prepare for um, how RTD might be able to play a role in in um, in part of uh, kind of the vaccination of the public. I think it's a really intriguing idea. Rut, could you? Could you send me and Matthew a copy of this, and then we can get this out to the whole accountability committee membership so everyone has a copy of the presentation? Be happy to do that. Great. Thank you. Yep. And any anyone else who doesn't fall in that category that wants one, just send me an email. I'll send you a copy of the presentation, too. But you'll be getting one uh, indirectly anyway. So Great. OK. Anything, anybody else that wanted to make a comment before we move on? Good, let's go. One, one final thing uh, is that uh, if this uh, plan is one that the Colorado Department of uh, Public Health and the Environment views as being a viable option and, and they really wanna pursue it, uh, I think, you know, we could reach out also to the American Public Transportation Association. After, yeah. You know, here it can work in, in many uh, urban areas uh, in, in particular. Uh, and uh, they could lobby Congress for some funding to help support it because, you know, RTD's already got some financial issues that they're, they're grappling with. And, uh, and this could be a great way for uh, the federal government to step in and provide some funding like CARES Act funding to help uh, support these efforts throughout the United States. Uh, it, it, it's going to depend a lot on, on how receptive I think our the state public health agency is to this kind of plan, but if they get behind it, then it might be replicable. Uh, we might be able to replicate it in, in, uh, in other communities as well. Yeah, and, and that's one thing I thought about it is, is you know, Colorado could really lead and hear the best practices for how to get this done as soon as possible. That benefits the whole country. And if, if we could get into that position, then boy, it would be great. It would be great for the state and it would be great for RTD as well. But it would help all the other states that have big transit agencies within them to say, hey, we hadn't thought about using these resources. And uh, so that's that's a great observation, Dan. We just have to figure out how to execute on all these things. <laughs> it's always the hard part. You know, brainstorming is easy and executing is hard. Anything, anybody else? Then let's move on to the rest of the agenda. Great. Thanks a lot, Rudd. Um, given well, that we all, given, minutes, yeah, given that we only have a couple minutes left, I think I'll, I'll just quickly introduce the two additional topics that were on the agenda today and then we'll just carry them over for discussion to the next meeting if that's okay with the subcommittee members so there were two two memos included in the agenda packet one is um, beginning the discussion of sort of identifying and beginning the comparison of rtd uh, with peer transit agencies and you know i i will say that i i cribbed a lot of feedback from Dan Blankenship. Thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, yeah, really helpful for me to kind of start thinking through. There are lots of different ways to identify peer agencies to RTD because every transit agency in the country is unique in terms of its size, the population, 
its territory, the services that it provides, how it's structured. So I think what you've seen is a working draft way that we're thinking about trying to identify different peer agencies and compare RTD to different peers and different measures. Uh, so um, we'll we'll continue to refine this. We'll have more information to share at the at the next um, subcommittee, and we'll be able to expand on um, that table. Um, Dan also did catch a, a little error in that, so the next version will be corrected in terms of the uh, uh, the rail um, system size um, of one of the transit agencies we're comparing. All the other numbers were correct. It was just that system size. I also just want to real quickly um, point out that another re really big uh, and good source of information is the American, um, the, um, sorry, APTA, the American uh, the Association of Public Transportation sure, Agencies, go. APTA, um, publishes an annual report that has uh, various information on a number of, of the really the largest transit systems around the country. So I included a link to that in that in that staff memo, so you can start looking as as also another way to sign up, help identify some peer agencies. So again, we'll talk a little bit more about that at the next meeting. And then the second memo. Um, at the request can I ask a question before you go on to the second memo? Yeah, absolutely, right. The after information I use that in the two books on autonomous vehicles that I wrote. And and it seemed like by the time I got to the second book, some of it was behind a firewall. You couldn't see all the numbers and all the data and everything else. Do you know if the most if it if there's anything that's not visible there now? I think there are there are certain there are certain pieces of information with that APTA publishes that are not generally available to the general public. Um, but, the but the, the, numbers the of APTA. The right. document that I provided the link to is should be publicly available to everyone. All right, good. Go um, ahead. The, yeah, thanks. And that, so the other issue was that came up at the last subcommittee meeting was, you know, what sort of statutory authorities and limitations relative to RTD's finances um, exist in state statute. So that memo, memo just includes a quick summary of some of the key statute sections uh, from state statute that if, that in my first view uh, felt like they um, had some direct or or fairly significant indirect impacts on rtd finances so take a look at take a look at that i i gave the um, statute sites as well as just a quick summary of of each of those but you know there are you know there are there are requirements for rtd um, or a, an allowance for rtd to provide a certain amount of their services through competitive private sort of services uh, there's a fair box recovery ratio requirement in state statute uh, there are some limitations on rtd in terms of how it can use its property around stations um, and that that can limit um, kind of what it what it does uh, that you know might not be the most uh, kind of might not maximize their uh, revenue recovery. Um, there's limits on uh, charging fees at parking areas. There's limitations on the levy of property taxes, um, forms of borrowing, uh, special ob obligation debt. So just a, a starting point for the subcommittee on some of the statute uh, uh, authorities and limitations related to the finances of RTD. So. Uh, that was the information that's included in the agenda with the subcommittee's permission. We'll just plan on carrying those over to the next meeting and coming back to them at the next meeting, which will happen on, where's my date now? Yeah. While, while you're looking at that date, uh, bear in mind that, that we're chartered from the legislature as well as the governor. And so... Yeah. One of the things we can do is we can go back to the legislature and say, here are some things that, that are holding our RTD back. Absolutely. It's possible we could get relief from some of these things, but I would I'd also say that uh, are we within this requirement of 30% fare box recovery? At this uh, point? Yes. The, the CAFR report that we provided that uh, we spoke about at the last meeting um, RTD goes through a very specific um, accounting process um, every budget and does that analysis, and they are they are complying with that uh, fare box recovery requirement. 
Is that as of 2019 or is that, that was as of the end of 2019? Uh, okay. I I don't know if Heather's still on the line and what what it might look like for uh, 2020. I suspect that it might be a different situation. Okay. Um, this is Heather McKillop. Um, I haven't run that number yet based on the 2021 budget because um, it's been moving quite a bit. But um, after October for the November adoption, we'll have run that number to see where we are. We have traditionally been well within that number because of the way the calculation is done. Right. But as we have mentioned in the past, it, it it is not a calculation that the industry uses the way it's done and um, could limit the ability of the um, uh, board to, like if they wanted to do, um, you know, fair free days, a bunch of them, or, um, you know, uh, lower the, the fair box revenue that could um, cause problems. Um, I am expecting there might be some problems because we had multiple months of free fares this year um, due to the pandemic. Um, but I just haven't run that number for 2020 yet because we don't have actuals. And then um, we typically run it for the new budget, which we haven't done yet. So it, it, it could be problematic. It has not been in the past, but based on where we are today, it could be. Was someone speaking? The, Heather, while you're still here, um, there's a thing called the service performance report that has a lot of the data that you need to look at. at fare box ratios and things like that. I've got the 2019 one, but is there an interim document that would provide any of that kind of information? No, we we only do that once a year and it usually comes out in the May-June timeframe because it takes a lot of work to put that document together. Uh-huh. Um, we do um, report ridership though, um, byline and fixed route versus paratransit in our monthly financial reports that right. go in the board packet at, for the finance administration committee so that's reported every month is that one of the things that we have uh, on our ability to go out and look at a variety of different financial information i know yes, that so I, I did methods. post an example of your our monthly reports and then um the i think the link will um update it to every month but i'm not sure but yeah i did post um or send through the process, um, uh, uh, an example of the monthly report. I saw and then it. it. Yeah. So Matthew, it's available could you every month. Sure that, we, that, it, that it does link to the most recent ones? Um, I will double check that. I'm not sure how that ended up coming through to you guys. So um, I will go out and see if I can check to make sure that updates to the most recent link every month. Great, thank you, Heather. Thank you, Heather. That's all I got. Okay. Uh, so uh, the next meeting is October 21st, 2020 um, at 11 o'clock, same time, same place. We'll send out uh, the agenda packet um, a few days beforehand and uh, meeting information. And one thing I, I want to ask is, is elites add so much value to these meetings. If there's any way that we can make sure we're not meeting when she's got her regularly scheduled uh, Boulder board meeting, Boulder city council, council or county or whatever. Yeah, um, Rut, we at the, you know, if the subcommittee wants us to come up with another uh, kind of doodle poll for something that will work for everybody, we, we struggled to find a time for the subcommittee meeting that would work for everybody. Uh, Commissioner Jones is not sort of her primary subcommittee assignment is not the finance committee so she's trying to as co-chair of the overall committee she's trying to attend as many subcommittee meetings as she can um, um, but I, I will just say we it's always a struggle with these groups to find a time that works for everybody i very much appreciate that uh, but i sure do want elise to be here because she's just such a terrific participant I agree. I think she adds a lot of value. And I'll just make one quick statement about the, the statutes. Uh, and Ron, maybe we can talk offline. Is that a lot of these, like Heather was suggesting, parking, TOD, contracting, fare box, I don't think any of them are going to be a huge source of revenue. But but I think that adding flexibility could make sense. So I'll try to touch base with you, Ron, this week. Okay. And then, Thanks, Lynn. Uh, Great. I agree about, about Elise. Yeah. 
Is that it? That's all we've got. Then we're adjourned. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.